Welcome to our new video series, Shared Parenting, A Child's Right. With rapidly rising parental separation and divorce rates, India has entered into a phase we call as Parenting 4.0. That is, from a whole village raising a child to joint families, to nuclear families, and we now have children being raised in separated households. Research on children in countries who've undergone this social transformation decades prior to us reveals extremely worrying statistics, which are available in our previous video, along with data from our Pan-India survey of parents and legal professionals. The link to the video is provided in the description below. Fortunately, we have the benefit of decades of research on lacks of children across the world on parenting plans which produce optimal outcomes in children of separated parents. And in order to discuss these research findings, we have with us one of the world's foremost researcher and academician, Dr. Linda Nielsen. Welcome uh, to our uh, video series, uh, Dr. Linda Nielsen. It's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you. I appreciate the invitation. I love sharing this research. Wonderful. So before we uh, really start introduce, uh, start talking to you about your research, uh, if I may just introduce our guest today, Dr. Linda Nielsen. Dr. Linda Nielsen is a professor of adolescent and educational psychology at Wake Forest University. Her research and courses are focused on children of separated parents and father-daughter relationships. In addition to her many academic articles, she has written three books on father-daughter relationships and a college textbook, Adolescence, a Contemporary View. In worldwide discussions on custody law reform, her research has been cited in at least 13 countries and 16 state legislatures, in a dozen family law textbooks and in numerous state bar association journals. She's also the vetted in five states as an expert research witness in child custody hearings. Her work has been featured in a PBS documentary on national public radio and in magazines and newspapers, including Time, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and the Washington Post. I have personally been very heavily influenced by two of her landmark research papers, that is her 2014 paper, Woozles, their role in custody law reform, parenting plans and family court, which is one of the most downloaded papers in the American Psychology Association's Journal of Psychology, Public Policy and Law. And her 2018 paper, Joint versus Sole Physical Custody, Children's Outcomes Independent of Parent-Child Relationships, Income and Conflict in 60 Studies. Both these papers cumulatively bust all the myths surrounding parenting time arrangements, which further the best interests and welfare of children of separated parents. Therefore, without much ado, Linda, if, may, if I may directly uh, dive deep into your research and ask you, does your research show any difference between uh, research uh, between outcomes of children of separated parents, depending on whether they are in sole custody, that is mom's custody, usually mom's custody, or uh, in what we call as Santa parenting, that is very little time to one parent and almost 90 plus plus of the time with the other, or in shared parenting. What does the research finding sh say about children's outcomes? Let me say first, I was curious about this, and I went back to all of the research studies that have ever, ever been published on that topic. That's 40 years of research wow. and 60 research studies. That's all of the ones that have been published over four decades. And in those 60 studies, the researchers looked at two groups of kids, children who lived with their mother, and spent some various amounts of time with their dad, and children who lived with both parents anywhere from 35% to 50% of the time all year round. So 
for simplicity, let's say sole custody, where the children had one home and lived with their mom, and shared parenting, where the children lived with their fathers 35% to 50% of the year. In looking at those two groups in 14 different countries, so we're talking about many, many cultures here, 14 different countries, tens of thousands of children, 40 years of research. Here's the bottom line. Children did better when they lived in a shared parenting family, meaning they have two homes, they do not live with one parent and have a visitor parent. They have two homes and two parents who are fully engaged in their day-to-day lives. Yeah. Well, how were these kids better? Again, we're looking at 14 countries. Yeah. We're looking at kids from the age of infants to the age of 18. 18 because that's when custody arrangements no longer matter. What did these researchers find? Again, 14 countries, 60 studies, children of all ages, boys and girls, different economic backgrounds. These were not rich parents. What the researchers found is the shared kids did better. How? They were less depressed. They had fewer anxiety disorders. They were less delinquent less aggressive, less bullying. They got, in other words, they got along better with other kids. They behaved themselves. Absolutely. The researchers also found these kids did better in school in terms of how they behaved towards their teachers. They weren't kicked out of school as often. Delinquency, they weren't breaking the law. They were less likely as teenagers to smoke and drink and do drugs. This part really shocked me. They had better physical health. Now, why in the world would that be? Think of stress. What happens to our body when we get stressed? In every country, every age person, a little kid, or we old folks, when we get stressed, the body gets sick. It's hooked to your immune system. So what they found in these studies is that the children had fewer stomach aches, fewer headaches. They slept better at night. They had fewer eating problems. They were in better health because They weren't as stressed. They weren't as stressed because they had a father and a mother both equally involved in their lives. So your body, your child's body is going to be healthier living in two homes. That was very surprising to me because a lot of people say, oh, children will be so stressed If they have to live in two houses, oh, you're just terrible to do this to the children. No, it turned out it is more stressful for the children to live in one home and have so little fathering time. So again, of course, it's a pain in the neck to live in two houses. It's a pain in the neck to have your parents get divorced, isn't it? Absolutely. Point is, for their physical health, these kids were better off living in two homes. Wow. The most important part for me, most important for me in these studies, the shared children had better relationships with their fathers, better relationships with their mothers, better relationships with their grandparents. Let's not forget the grandparents. Grandparents are important to children. Better relationships with the grandparents. Better relationships with their step-parents. 
So all of the adults who are involved in helping to raise these children, the kids had better relationships with those adults when they lived in two homes in a shared parenting family. So the research, and let me add, many people were very concerned about children under the age of five. Well, maybe shared parenting is fine for kids who are six to 18. But what about the babies and the toddlers, the children who are not in school yet? Yes. Yeah. Five studies looked at those children in that age group. Five studies. They found that the shared children, we're talking about infants, toddlers, Mm -hmm. four year olds, five year olds, they were better behaved, more emotionally calm, Mm -hmm. less Mm -hmm. stressed. And how do we know a little child is stressed? They bite and hit and can't sleep and will eat, refuse to eat. They throw temper tantrums. They're stressed. True, true. And asthma. Asthma is a reaction to stress. It's not caused by stress. Okay. Yeah, asthma yeah. is a disease that exists for some children. But when an asthmatic child is stressed, it can set off more wheezing, more asthma attacks. So they even found for these little kids living in two homes, the kids had less physical problems with asthma. In other words, sharing the baby, sharing the toddler, sharing the four-year-old, these kids got along better with their other little playmates. They were less aggressive. They were less withdrawn, okay? They interacted more with the other children. You know, the opposite of aggression is to have a little three-year-old who won't play with the other children, who's so afraid and so shy. So that is what the 60 studies have shown us. No, so if I were to just... uh you know, put it in a pop science kind of a language that I like to use. It's so children in shared parenting have better IQs, better EQs, and better SQs, and better life expectancy. And I think we must not forget, you know, the 90-year ongoing study of Howard, which says that what predicts great satisfied life and high life expectancy is your relationship with your parents and your peer group, right? So I think it's 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 something that becomes an absolute no-brainer that you know, come what may, we must have a shared shared parenting. But taking you to the next question, if I may, uh, you know, one of the things that we always see is that sick, there is. After divorce, there is typically going to be a lot of conflict at times between the parents. You know, sometimes, uh, and that's obvious, that is the very reason that the parents are divorcing. Otherwise, why would they really be divorcing? And some of the judges really believe that, you know, and which is true, that conflict between parents tends to stress the child and it, uh, you know, it tends to actually produce poorer children outcomes, right? Therefore, it's a lot of our judges and our community believe that whenever there is a conflict between parents, it is better to just separate the parents and give the child to one, uh, a one parent. How does research answer that question? What does your research state about that? Mm-hmm. Of these studies, about half of them looked at the conflict between the parents. They had the parents say, how much, how well do we get along? Well, as you said, not very well. So they compared the children after they considered how much conflict the parents had. Same outcome. The children in the high conflict families, Mm -hmm. in high conflict, your parents don't like each other. They fight. 
They yeah. they are not friends. They do not co-parent. Okay. Right. Right. If you put those children in a shared parenting home, yes. they still did better than the children who lived with their mother. Now, right. why would that be? Why? Yes. Conflict is not good for kids. We know that. But conflict remains, even if children live with their mother, the children know that their parents are in conflict. They don't get along. You know that your mom and dad don't like each other. They argue a lot. Even if you live with your mother, that conflict still exists. It doesn't go away. In fact, there might be more conflict because your father is mad that he doesn't get to see you to help you. Right. Right. But the better way to look at it is this. Let's forget divorce. You're in a married family. Mm-hmm. Your parents do not get along. They argue a lot. Mm-hmm. Your parents are married. They argue a lot. This is bad for you as a kid. This is not good, especially if they pull you into the middle of it. But, but in a married family, those children are better off if they have a close relationship with both parents. Right? Right. If you have a close relationship with both of your parents, it helps you as a child deal with your parents' conflict. Now, in shared parenting, we already know that these kids have a closer relationship with their father and their grandparents and their step-parents. All these people can help that child deal with their parents' conflict. The way I tell my students is this. Conflict is like a cut, okay? You're cutting your child. Why are you doing that? Well, they're going to do that if the children live in one home or two home. There's still conflict. Yeah, yeah. Let's put a Band-Aid on the cut. What is the Band-Aid? A close relationship with both parents. That's beautifully yeah. said. If you want to double handicap a kid, there's the conflict, then take away the Band-Aid. Oh, Um, you're giving, we cannot control parent conflict simply by having the children live with their mother. That does not eliminate conflict. One of the other things that I was seeing, I don't know if uh, I've read it correctly, but one of the other research which was coming out, especially from countries like Australia and Sweden, is what I saw that uh, there is evidence that shared parenting tends to decrease conflict, I mean, between the parents rather than increase it. And that acts further to take uh, your words, further increases the Band-Aid for the car. Is that true? It is true. Because again, what do most parents argue about when they are separating? The children. True. The parenting time. That is the source of the conflict. <laughs> that is the source of the conflict. Absolutely. So if you take away the source of the conflict. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Sorry. So, yep. so the conflict is very, very important. Wouldn't it be wonderful if married parents always agreed on how to raise their children? <laughs> Wouldn't it be great Never. if married pa- And that doesn't happen. Okay. Never. Parents have different parenting styles. Yes. Fathers and mothers parent differently, which is good. That's a good thing. Yes. That's a good thing. In a married family, Your father and your mother relate differently to the children. They parent differently. That will also be the case when the children live in two homes. Your mother and father 
parent differently. I wanted to ask you that very question. You know, one of the other major objections that we see to shared parenting is that the two parents, especially in a country like India, which, you know, I love to say every hundred kilometers, right? The culture changes, the language changes, the clothes change, the food habits change, right? Similarly, you know, when children are living in two different parents' home and shared parenting arrangement, doesn't it lead to any confusion in the child's mind? Does the child get confused signals, you know, like, a lot of times we say, okay, the religion may be different. One is praying to Allah and the other is praying to Christ and the third is praying to Krishna. So does it not lead to uh, confusion in the mind of the children? If that were true, why would those children have better outcomes? Yeah. <laughs> it, now, and let's go back to this. If your parents are married yeah. and one prays to one God and one prays to the other God, or one is Jewish and one is Christian, or one is Muslim and, and one is atheist, you know? Sure. You, you see those differences as a child. That does not make you love your parents any less. Yeah. It doesn't make you need your parents any less. It doesn't mean your parents can't contribute important things to you. This happens in married families. It happens in separated families. The children don't love their parents for their religion or their differences. They love their parents because your parent is there and involved in your life. Now, another example that I tend to give to a lot of people based on my understanding, worldwide, there is this amazing and very rightly so uh, movement towards bringing in greater diversity at the workplace, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. more diverse the opinions, more diverse the uh, inputs that come in, actually, truthfully, it produces a better output, better work product. And similarly, I believe for children, the more diverse inputs that they keep receiving from not just two parents, the four grandparents and their extended families, it tends to. Would you agree to something like that? Yes. And this is why when we look at how these children are doing, yeah. they have a greater network of people in their family. They don't lose half of their family. Yes. yes. And they not only learn diversity, but they learn, I can love people who don't agree with one another, who are not alike. Everybody in the family does not have to be a clone, you know. Yeah. And this is why children in shared parenting families, because their parents are different. Sure. The way you parent is different. The way you see the world is different. That is a benefit to children. Yes. Yes. That's the benefit. Sure. So, Moving ahead, I think you did touch upon it, but, you know, in India, if I may just say so, India has a law which says that children less than the age of five under normal circumstances will remain in the custody of the mother, right? This obviously originates from traditional gender roles that we have, you know, across cultures, the gender roles have been prescribed. Uh, and unfortunately, our laws governing custody are 100 years old, right? We're still living in the colonial era, as we would like to mention. But what does research state about something like this? Should we postpone shared parenting to, let's say, when the child is four or five years old? Because a lot of us believe that fathers typically can't take care of young children who are maybe one or two years old, or even toddlers. These old ideas are based on emotion and beliefs. They are not based on science. They are not based on science. So whether we're talking about shared parenting or other aspects of child behavior, yeah. how we're supposed to parent. You know, in the United States, it used to be okay to hit your children. That was considered part of good discipline. Yeah. Now we see that 
hitting your children teaches them to be more aggressive. So we have to change as the science shows us we have not been doing this correctly. For example, people used to believe, maybe still do believe, that children bond, the infant bonds immediately to its mother and forms a strong attachment. This is not true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Infants do not bond to an adult till they are six months old. And they bond equally to the mother and to the father. We have to let the science in before we can change how we parent. We used to put leeches on people thinking this would make them healthy. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> we, we've done a lot of silly things in the past. We have to let the science in. Absolutely. And in those first four years, yeah. that is when the strongest attachments are formed. Yeah. Why would I deprive my baby and toddler? Why would I deprive that child of one of the strongest attachments he or she is going to have in their lives. True, true, true. No, I think that's that's beautifully said because one of the uh, uh, podcasts that I was doing a few days back, we were discussing exactly that and what we found that you would, of course, be aware of it, that the oxytocin level, which is and the real parenting and love hormone, as we call it, are almost in sync for fathers and mothers equally, right? So yes. both of them are equally bonding. And it's a very unfortunate uh, thing that years back there became this thing which said that the best thing that a father could do is to pamper the mom, right? So that used to be a saying. And unfortunately, thankfully, that has been completely busted away, and which is, which is a great thing. But moving on to the next uh, thing, I was wondering, you know, in India, uh, you know, I don't know if you've had the chance to see our survey findings, which, yes, which, uh, yes. Uh, which uh, you know, as we discussed, are extremely worrying for the future of our children. Would you agree with that, that they are extremely worrying? Yes, because those beliefs and policies are depriving the children of one of their parents. Absolutely. You are depriving children. Okay. In the same way, why would you deprive children of a vaccine that would prevent them from getting measles? Would you deprive children of that vaccine? Oh, well, let's wait till the children are six years old before we give them that vaccine. Your child may be dead yeah. if you don't give them that vaccine. So in the same way you would not withhold a vaccine, you would not withhold any other thing that science showed was good for your child. Science shows that your baby, your toddler, your four-year-old benefits from having that father actively involved, actively involved. Absolutely. In you cannot see a two-year-old every two weeks they may not even remember you every two weeks. Yes. Little children, especially, we know this, their brains, they need that contact constant, constant, constant with the people who love them to bond. So think of the father as a great vaccine, if you will. Absolutely. That's beautifully said. That's beautifully said. I think so. One of the things that we also found in our survey was that. You know, typically it takes almost a year after filing of the suit for, uh, you know, to get even the basic interim access order, during which time the parent, one of the parents, typically the father, does not even get to meet with his child. So a lot of the judges believe that, okay, by now the child would have settled in, in the new circumstance and without the parent. What does research say? Should after a year, year and a half, should we institute shared parenting or should we just 
allow the child and not un so-called unsettle them. In those 60 studies, yes. there were children who, you know how the courts work and the laws mm -hmm. work. There were children in those 60 studies who had lived in one home for a year, maybe even two years. Okay. They still benefited when you moved them. Let me give you an example. Let's say your child is two years old and has been in a daycare center for a year. And then you find out there's a better daycare center down the road. Right. Are you going to keep your child in the worst daycare center or move your child? Oh, you will move your child. Absolutely. It's a better school. It's a better situation. So the change, we have to look at the long term impact. We're talking about the next 18 years of your child's life. If we have to move the child from living in one home to living in two homes, and we know the long range benefit is two homes, yeah. you move the child. Again, if a vaccine is discovered and you say, oh, it's been a year, I won't get it because now my child's, no, you, you move your child at whatever age to what the science is telling you is best for your child. Change Absolutely. is not bad. Change is not bad, right. Change no, in fact, uh, I had, uh, uh, you may be aware of him, I had Dr. William Burnett, uh, a famous child psychiatrist uh, on the show a few, uh, a week back or so. And he said a lot of these children, when they go to this house and they do shared parenting, most of them say, Thank goodness somebody thought about it, yeah. right? So it is hardly unsettling for these children. So that's, that's, but coming to the, you know, one of the core issues, which is a lot of these studies have been done in what we call as economically advanced countries, typically countries like US, Australia, maybe Sweden and other such. While we in India have maybe a different culture or different parenting styles, different parenting culture. Do these studies hold true even for a country like India? 14 countries, 14 different countries. They have different cultures. Yes. They have different ways of different ways of raising a child. But in India or Italy or Ireland, Children developmentally are the same. A three-year-old in Italy or a three-year-old in India yeah. still has the same emotional needs, still has the same needs for security, still has the same needs for two parents helping that child grow up. That has nothing to do with culture. That is what it is to be a human child. That child needs its father, whether that father is Italian, Irish, American, Australian. The culture doesn't change what children need at different stages of development. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, uh, like I simply say, so when I talk to a lot of evolutionary biologists, they tell me that one of the reasons humans have dominated over planet Earth is because we practice dual parenthood. And that is for the entire humanity. That is not for USA or for England or for Italy Ireland. That is true all across the world, right? Yes. So, yeah. So coming to uh, one another question on this. You know, a lot of uh, the judges that I speak to, they say, Look, science is forever evolving. At the end of the day, it is always finding out with new findings, right? Do you think the study of this child custody and parenting time arrangements has reached a point where you as an academician and a researcher can very conclusively say that science has reached a point where we can now, without any doubt, say that shared parenting 
is the best arrangement in whatever circumstances, leaving about, let's say, those 5% of cases where there is domestic violence and genuine abuse. Yeah. Right. Is it conclusive now? What do you feel? Let me leave me out of this for a minute and let's look at the larger scientific community. There is now consensus. There is an excellent consensus paper by Richard Warshock where 110 international researchers, 110 agreed that shared parenting for children of all ages, infants, toddlers, those 110 researchers agreed shared parenting is best for children. There was another group in the United States, an organization that is the largest organization for mental health professionals and family court professionals. It's called the American Association of um, Conciliatory Family and Conciliatory Courts. AFCC, right, yes. 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 yes, yes, yes. Their group of experts, they brought together a think tank. Their group of experts came to the same conclusion. Shared wow. parent is best for children, okay? So we have groups now coming together saying, yes, this is the best alternative for children. Brilliant. Brilliant. No, that's what I, I believe Malin Bergstrom from Karolinska Institute also did some amazing research on that. And I think everywhere, you know, so whichever side you look at, whichever country you look at, whichever uh, culture you look at, there is just one consensus emerging everywhere, which is very rare in science. You know, as a doctor, I can tell you two doctors will never agree on the mode of treatment for cancer ever. They can't. And to see researchers like 110 you're talking about agree and on something, I think that's a miracle at times. It's very amazing. It is amazing. And um, there is a, also another group, which was the International Conference on Shared Parenting, where you had researchers from many different countries. This group of 12 people also agreed that based on science, yeah. this is what is best for children. Wow. We've tried the other approach. We've tried the other approach for True. decades. It yeah. was applied to all children. Nothing was individualized. Nothing was considered, but this is the way to do it. We prescribe this for all children. The end. No, we I think that's some, one of the know. most important things that you've just said. You know, the divorce rates and parental separation rates in India are now rising. But countries like the US, Australia, Sweden, and others have gone through this social transformation much prior to us. If we don't learn from some of the mistakes that the Western countries have done, I think we'll be doomed again and go through exactly the same problem. We need to learn from some of the things that uh, you've done. But lastly, if I may in, take your indulgence for just two, three minutes more, would be um, one of the things that I've heard from a lot of my guests who've come prior to you on the show have said that there is a huge amount of discrimination and bias against fathers. And that is, again, a huge amount of research that you've done on father-daughter relationship. Mm -hmm. What one of the two or three things that you can tell us which would say that how important are fathers in a child's life? What does your research or the research across the world say about the importance and role of fathers and the, and the father-daughter relationship? We've known for decades how important fathers are to children. That is not new. The, the research in child development, that is not a question. But we have assumed that mother, that daughters need their mothers more than they need their fathers. We have assumed that boys need their fathers yes. more than they need their mothers. The research does not support that. Girls need their fathers as much as they need 
their mothers. Yeah. Why? What's the deal? A father, the quality, the quality of the father's relationship with his daughter has a greater impact than the mother's relationship with the daughter in four areas of the daughter's life. Okay. Now hear this. Fathers are more important than mothers to the daughters in four areas of the daughter's life. Okay. Married or not married. Doesn't matter if your parents are married. That's irrelevant. Yeah. First, the daughter's relationship with men. Right. Okay. Right. Her dating, her marrying, how she gets along with men, how well she communicates. Does she trust them? Does she know yeah. how to pick the good ones and avoid the bad ones? Yeah. This is not related to her relationship with her mother. It's related to the quality of her relationship with her father. We see more teenage pregnancies in uh, daughters who don't have a very involved father. Is that right? Yes. Teenage pregnancy, risky sex, drinking and using drugs during sex. This also applies to very educated daughters. Daughters in college, who have close relationships with their fathers, even when the parents are divorced. Yeah. If that daughter has a close relationship with her father, she is less likely to have sex with men she doesn't love or like. Yeah. She is less likely to be clinically depressed. She is less likely to have an eating disorder. She is less likely to use drugs and alcohol. So if you want to protect your daughter from making foolish choices with men. Protect her relationship with her father. It's the father-daughter thing. The second area is your daughter's career, her future job. That is more closely connected wow. to the quality of her relationship with her father. Why? Because your father is the one who pushes you and encourages you to try things that scare you right. and go into science and to go into engineering. Let me show you how not to be afraid. That comes from your father more than from your mother. Oh, interesting. And there is research to back this up? Uh, I have written three books about it. <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> yeah, great, great research. And the third is for leadership of daughters, world leaders, women who become famous politicians, women who become great athletes. That is all leadership, self confidence. That is about the girl's relationship with her father more than her relationship with her mother. So for child custody, for shared parenting, yes. the child who is more likely to suffer from not having her dad is the daughter, not the son, the daughter. Yeah. Malin Bergstrom also stated that in his paper, I think that's true. Yep, yep, yep. Sorry, continue, please. Yes. So. We have many negative stereotypes about fathers. We have many negative stereotypes about Muslims and African Americans and name your group. Okay. We must take those stereotypes about fathers just like we do for religious groups or racial groups. Yes. We must apply the science to destroy the stereotype. When we do that about fathers, when we destroy the stereotype that you are inferior to mothers, the stereotype is you are inferior to mothers. Which is the not science true. does not back that. Once you change the stereotype, the custody laws will follow and they will change to let children have their fathers. Give children the gift of their fathers. They deserve that. 
beautifully said. I think, you know, one of the controversial things I always say that, you know, what caused the Second World War was lack of science because they believed that the Aryans race of the Hitler was far superior than the so-called Jews race. Yes. And we don't want to repeat those same mistakes. But I think one of the most important takeaways from you, for me, was today there is this huge uh, effort in India going towards women empowerment and putting them together and putting them in position of powers and bringing them. I think what I hear from you very beautifully that one of the best things that you can do if you want independent, powerful women is have them involve fathers. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Empower the daughters. Give them their fathers. Give them yeah. their fathers. And you don't wait till they're six years old to give them their fathers. True, true, true. That is so beautifully said, and that is such a wonderful thing to, uh, a wonderful point to end our uh, discussion today. And what a beautiful takeaway. But may I request if, because this topic about father daughter relationship is something we would really like you to come and speak again with us. I really hope that if you would have the time to come and talk to us in detail about your research across the world on fathers and daughters. I would be glad to do that. I would welcome that. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. You as right. well.